My name is Mariangela Pellegrini. I'm the Educational and Patients Program Manager for the Iran Euroblonet, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the all ERN to the fourth topic on focus on thrombotic microangiopathy webinars for health professionals. As you may know, this program has been developed by a collaboration between Euroblonet and CNR MAT and will consist of 15 sessions. Furthermore, the program is accredited by 11 continuing medical education point of the European Board for Accreditation in Hematology. So, dear audience, please welcome with me the speaker of today's session is the Professor Paul Coppo, who will lead this session on present and future of thrombotic tropocytopenic purpura treatment. Paul Kofpo is professor of hematology at Sorbonne University in Paris. He has had the French reference center for thrombotic microangiopathies. Indeed, Paul Kofpo has set up ex nilo this reference center, which is a resource center for the diagnosis and the management of thrombotic microangiopathy. And he is also head of the Department of Lymphoid Malignancy in Saint Antoine Hospital, in, involved in the management of rare lymphoid malignancies and other immunohemological disease. So please, Professor Coppo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Marie Angela, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. And good afternoon, uh, everybody. And uh, indeed, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar dedicated to the present and future of uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura treatment. So as a reminder, uh, TTP is a specific form of thrombotic microangiopathy uh, characterized by the association of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which means that the patients have uh, fragmented red cells or schistocytes on blood smear a profound peripheral thrombocytopenia with a platelet count typically below 30,000, organ failure of variable severity as a result of uh, uh, microthrombi in uh, microvessels of most organs. And in this disease, there is a specific biomarker, which is a severe deficiency in adam statin the one bit run factor uh, uh, cleaving protease. And this uh, enzyme deficiency results from two mechanisms uh, that lead to uh, two forms of the disease. The first results uh, 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 from uh, BLLIC mutations of the gene encoding uh, uh, to uh, Adam 13 in the congenital form of the disease, formerly called upshaw schumann syndrome. This is an uh, ultra-rare disease, an orphan disease, uh, that involves uh, neonates uh, and uh, children in the post-neonatal period, as well as uh, childbearing age women. Uh, and uh, the most uh, frequent form of the disease is the autoimmune form of the disease in which patients develop autoantibodies directed against Adam statin. <laughs> this form of the disease involves typically one woman. This disease is uh, uh, spontaneously fatal. And the incidence of the disease ranges from two to three cases per million habitants per year, which means that in France, we have uh, yearly uh, a bit more than 120 new patients. So I will speak here to keep the time mostly uh, of the autoimmune form of the disease for which uh, <coughs> uh, uh, progresses in uh, uh, the management has been tremendous these last years. This is also a reminder of the clinical picture of uh, autoimmune TTP. As you know, this disease uh, typically involves uh, women uh, on, in uh, childbearing age, uh, people from uh, Africa, Caribbeans, and the West Indies 
are typically more exposed to the disease, which supposes the, the existence of uh, genetic risk factors for the disease in these uh, ethnical groups. Uh, you can appreciate here that uh, up to 50% of patients present with cerebral involvement. And uh, interestingly, uh, years ago, the uh, prevalence of uh, cerebral involvement could reach 90%, which means that during these last years, we could learn uh, uh, to uh, diagnose uh, the disease earlier than in the past. Uh, regarding biology, cytopenias are typically profound. And again, uh, thrombocytopenia is typically below 30,000. <coughs> and conversely, renal involvement is uh, not so common and typically mild. And uh, as a result, end stage renal disease is extremely rare in this disease. These uh, clinical findings are interesting because they could be used to derive clinical scores aimed at predicting in real time adamstatin activity. And this is crucial in this disease because uh, as you know, uh, there is some uh, uh, turnaround time to have adamstatin activity uh, in traumatic macroangiopathies in general and it takes typically three to uh, seven days to uh, have adamstatin uh, activity for clinicians. And this is in contrast with the fact that we do need in this disease to introduce in real time targeted therapies to uh, improve the prognosis of the disease. So this is why there is a crucial need to have an idea of adamstatin activity as soon as a diagnosis of traumatic macroangiopathy is made. <laughs> so for that, we uh, uh, took the advantage of some specific aspects of uh, uh, the clinical features in TTP to set up clinical scores. You can see here the two uh, main scores, the French score and the plastic score. The French score was uh, the first uh, score to be uh, developed uh, uh, some years ago, and basically both scores uh, go in the same way. They uh, state that in patients with features of thrombotic macroangiopathy and no associated conditions, which includes a, a, a context of cancer, chemotherapy, transplantation, uh, severe sepsis, and so on, in those patients, a severe thrombocytopenia below 30,000 and a mild renal involvement as defined by a serum creatinine level below 2.26 milligram per deciliter is associated in almost all cases uh, with a severe adamstatin deficiency. So this is uh, clearly uh, practical and this uh, allows, as we will see, to propose to these patients targeted therapies as soon as the diagnosis of thrombotic macroangiopathy is made. <laughs> this is what you uh, have to know about the pathophysiology to understand the treatment of uh, uh, TTP and more especially autoimmune TTP. Those patients produce autoantibodies directed against adamstatin. This leads to a severe adamstatin deficiency and as a, as a result, high molecular weight VWF multimers accumulate in plasma of these patients. And these uh, multimers are hyperadhesive towards platelets. And this leads to the formation of microthrombi in most organs in the microvasculature. And left untreated, uh, virtually all patients die from the disease. So once you have that in mind, it is easy to understand that the first way to treat these patients is to provide adamstatin to replenish the adamstatin levels. And this is achieved by bringing large volumes of plasma to these patients through plasma exchange that allow to bring adamstatin that will saturate the antibodies against the enzyme and 
cleave the large VWF multiverse. <laughs> the second way is to target the immune system with uh, 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 reduximab, with cyclosporin A, with antiplasma uh, uh, compounds, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, immune suppressors such as steroids, cyclophosphamide, and so on. And the third and most uh, recent uh, strategy consists in inhibiting the pathologic interaction between VWF and the receptor of uh, VWF, the GP1B, at the surface of Taptex. And this could be recently uh, achieved with the use of the nanobody Keplacizumab. Uh, we'll come back on it uh, soon. This is the historical treatment of uh, TTP that was uh, set up from those two uh, works published in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the early 90s. And from those two works, uh, it was uh, stated that patients with uh, TTP had to be treated with a daily plasma exchange and steroids in emergency until remission. So this has been the, the core treatment of TTP for years. And uh, with this regimen, the prognosis of the disease was outstandingly improved since remission and survival could reach more than 85%. Whereas before the systematic use of this uh, regimen, uh, almost all patients died from the disease. However, uh, there were uh, still some uh, unmet needs with this uh, historical uh, treatment. <laughs> Since patients could experience uh, exacerbations of the disease in up to 50% of cases, exacerbations are typically uh, a condition on which patients worsen the condition despite a well-conducted uh, treatment. And uh, the other uh, uh, worse, uh, worrying outcome is a refractoriness on which uh, patients uh, do not respond to this uh, uh, treatment. This involves uh, more or less 10% uh, of patients. So those patients with a suboptimal response to standard treatment are of course exposed to more death and to more uh, complications due to treatment and especially due to uh, plasma exchange associated uh, uh, complications. So the question was how to improve those uh, results. So it's in this context that we started to use rituximab uh, at the acute phase of the disease in uh, autoimmune TTP. So rituximab, interestingly, uh, 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 at the acute phase could uh, prevent slow responses to plasma exchange. So in other words, rituximab could limit the duration of plasma exchange treatment in this disease. So this was the, the, the good news, but the bad news was that rituximab uh, 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 is not efficient in real time in this disease. And you can see in this picture that despite the uh, 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 early use of rituximab, patients uh, may uh, um, uh, still remain uh, uh, thrombocytopenic for uh, many days before a durable platelet recovery. And uh, it was reported that on average, from the first rituximab infusion to the uh, durable platelet recovery, uh, uh, we have to wait for almost two weeks. Uh, uh, and during this window of uh, two weeks, uh, everything can still occur, including uh, uh, death. We need to find a new time uh, on which patients could still worsen the disease and even die. So uh, I was saying that uh, regarding the unmet needs with the use of only plasma exchange and steroids, we started to use rituximab to prevent slow responses to plasma exchange. <laughs> and indeed, 
with the uh, systematic use of rituximab at the acute phase of the disease, along with a plasma exchange and steroids, we could limit the duration of plasma exchange treatment. However, the, the bad news in, the, in this story is that rituximab is not efficient in real time. So this means that uh, when you start rituximab in uh, TTP, you have to wait for almost two weeks before platelets and uh, clinical uh, uh, pictures of the disease completely recover. So during these uh, uh, two weeks window, uh, during which rituximab is still not efficient, patients can still worsen the disease and even die. Okay, so there was a need to find an additional agent able to control the disease at the early step of the management until rituximab is efficient. The other interesting point with the use of rituximab, and this is a crucial aspect, is that rituximab remarkably protects patients from early, early relapses. You can see in this picture that rituximab at the acute phase of the disease nicely protects patients from relapses for 12 to 18 months. On the opposite, patients, uh, physical patients who did not receive rituximab at the acute phase of the disease experience uh, relapses soon after they recovered from the acute phase. And this is because without the use of rituximab, 40% of patients uh, 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 remain with a severe adaptogen deficiency despite a clinical recovery of the disease. Moreover, 40 other percent of patients uh, are left with a mild decrease in adaptogen activity, although the enzyme activity is detectable. So in total, 80% of patients uh, after the acute phase of the disease uh, uh, remain with a mild or uh, severely decreased adamsetine activity. And of course, those patients are prone to relapse. So this is why it is now uh, important and strongly recommended to use rituximab systematically frontline in this disease in association to plasma exchange and steroids to better stabilize adamsetine activity throughout time and protect patients from relapse. So the third <coughs> episode of the uh, story of TTP management is uh, uh, the use of keplacizumab. Keplacizumab is an antibody able to target specifically the A1 domain of VWF uh, and uh, this prevents the uh, interaction between the A1 domain of VWF and the GP1B receptor on platelets. So uh, uh, keplacizumab is an anti-adhesive agent able to prevent the neoformation of microtrombi in this disease. So keplacizumab was uh, evaluated through two large randomized control studies, uh, Titan first and Hercules thereafter. So you can see here the flowchart of the second study, the Hercules trial, that randomized 145 patients between placebo and keplacizumab in association in all cases with the uh, historical treatment and uh, 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 in uh, many, but not all cases, uh, rituximab. So this is the primary endpoint of the uh, trials. This is the uh, integrated analysis of Titan plus Hercules. And the primary endpoint was the time to first battle count recovery. And you can see, interestingly, that uh, those studies are positive since patients in the capacizumab arm uh, recovered battle count uh, faster than patients in the placebo groups. And this is uh, important and interesting because in this disease, patients are exposed to death during this period of thrombocytopenia. So less exposure to thrombocytopenia means less exposure to death. More interestingly, the difference between the two curves 
is uh, particularly obvious at the very early step of the management. You can see here that the difference between the two curves is uh, 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 obvious uh, during the two weeks, the two first weeks of the management. And if you remember well, these two weeks uh, of uh, uh, these two first weeks correspond to the window of time during which rituximab is not efficient. Okay, so this is interesting because this means that caplacizumab in TTP is able to protect patients and hasten fatal count recovery uh, um, until uh, rituximab uh, uh, improves adamsetine activity. All these aspects translate, as you can see on, the, uh, uh, on these uh, uh, results, you can see that in the caplacizumab arms, there is no death versus four deaths in the placebo groups. You can see that more impressively regarding exacerbations, almost 35% of patients in the placebo groups experience exacerbations versus less than 6% in the caplacizumab arms. And if you go directly to the bottom of the slide, you can see that regarding refractoriness, there was no refractoriness in the capacity of arms versus seven cases of uh, refractoriness in the placebo groups. So from these uh, results, the agent uh, uh, obtained a label for the use in uh, autoimmune TTP uh, frontline as soon as the clinical diagnosis is made in the United States and in Europe. So now uh, 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 in the, uh, many countries, uh, Caplacizumab is available uh, for uh, the treatment of autoimmune TTP along with the uh, standard treatment that uh, includes plasma exchange and immunosuppression. <coughs> so, uh, as soon as we uh, uh, could uh, have caplacizumab available in, uh, in France, uh, we could use it through an early access program uh, period. And during this uh, period of time, we set up a, a, a regimen, the Caplavi regimen, derived from uh, the Hercules uh, trial to uh, address rapidly uh, uh, um, the, the, to improve our experience in the use of caplacizumab in our country. So we uh, um, proposed uh, to treat patients with TTP at the national level with a triplet regimen associating daily plasma exchange, immunosuppression with steroids and rituximab, and caplacizumab. And after uh, uh, complete uh, uh, response achievement, an uncertain activity was assessed uh, weekly until uh, uh, it uh, became normal. So we could treat uh, during an uh, uh, 18 months period of time, 90 patients with this uh, triplet regimen. So the triplet regimen uh, defines uh, patients who received caplacizumab. And these 90 patients were compared with uh, our historical cohorts composed of 180 uh, patients which were the most recent patients managed just before the area of Caplacizumab. And you can see here the uh, primary and secondary outcomes of those patients treated according to the uh, triplet regimen. You can see that the composite, the, the primary uh, outcome of this uh, study was a composite of death and refractoriness. And you can see that interestingly in the triplet regimen, only two patients out of 90 uh, reach this uh, composite outcome, which means 2.2% versus more than 12% in the historical cohorts. This means that patients in the triplet regimen who received once again caplacizumab experience very rarely death uh, a bit more than 1% versus 6.7% in the historical group. 
And respiratory nurse similarly was observing only one patient in the triplet regimen versus 16 patients, 18% in the historical group. More strikingly, uh, regarding exacerbations, 44% of patients experienced exacerbations in the historical group versus less than 4% uh, of exacerbations in the triplet regimen. And regarding the uh, uh, remaining uh, results, uh, this is to show that this uh, rapid uh, response to treatment translated in uh, an alleviation in the uh, uh, burden of care. So these patients required, required uh, twice less plasma exchange, twice less uh, uh, volumes of plasma, and uh, the duration of uh, hospitalization could be divided by uh, twofold. So uh, these were uh, interesting results that uh, fully confirmed the uh, uh, international uh, clinical uh, trials. You can see here uh, the cumulative hazard ratio for platelet count recovery. And you can see that the patients in the triplet cohort recovered durable platelet count uh, uh, twice more uh, rapidly than uh, patients in the historical cohorts. And this is to show that uh, those patients treated in the triplet regimen received systematically rituximab frontline, and this could result in a, a faster improvement in adapted activity. You can see in the uh, red uh, histograms that patients who received rituximab uh, improved adapted activity. Uh, uh, in the uh, first weeks of the management, whereas patients in the historical group who only received rituximab as a salvage therapy, uh, so um, uh, 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 later uh, throughout uh, the management, those patients improved adaptive inactivity typically uh, after many weeks. So this is an important aspect because this means that the sooner you introduce rituximab, the sooner you will observe an improvement in uh, adam certain activity, and the sooner you will be able to stop the treatment with capleciumab. This is a, 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 um, an illustrative patient treated with the triplet regimen this is actually the very first patient in France treated with the, uh, the triplet regimen. This was a 45-year-old woman with uh, no uh, uh, specific uh, history. Uh, she had some uh, overweight and she had typical features of traumatic microangiopathy. She had a CV thrombocytopenia. She had a mild renal involvement, so the French score was of two. So we immediately made the diagnosis of TTP and we started the treatment. Uh, by the way, she had a cerebral involvement as well as a heart involvement defined by an elevated uh, troponin level. So this patient was exposed to death, to exacerbations and refractoriness. Nevertheless, you can see that immediately after the treatment was started, she nicely improved the platelet count. And you can appreciate that platelet count improved rapidly and durably with no further worsening. Okay. Similarly, LDH level that uh, uh, reflects organ injury dramatically dropped immediately after treatment was started <laughs> to normal values. And this uh, normal value of LDH uh, 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 persisted throughout uh, time. And uh, thereafter, we monitored uh, adam certain activity weekly after uh, platelet count recovery. And as soon as uh, adam certain activity reached 20%, uh, uh, we could stop uh, caplacizumab. 
and uh, uh, you can see that these patients required less than seven days of daily plasma exchange. She experienced no uh, 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 complications uh, of the disease and uh, she was treated uh, basically with uh, a bit more than uh, three weeks of uh, cabalistizumab and she's now uh, doing well. Regarding side uh, adverse events uh, with the use of cabalistizumab, we had no further red light uh, regarding the, uh, uh, in the reports of the international trials. We had two major bleedings, including one MRI shock in an elderly patient who had a, a history of chronic renal failure. He was also uh, treated with a, an antiplatelet agent. So uh, this is to say that uh, we have to be careful in the use of capacizumab in the elderly. And this is an uh, aspect we are uh, currently uh, uh, addressing. We had uh, many cases of uh, clinically relevant non-major bleedings, uh, mainly uh, epistaxis. We have cases of uh, 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 small hematomas, gingival bleeding, echimosis, but uh, uh, these were uh, easily uh, manageable. Some cases of uh, inflammatory reaction at the injection site uh, that were uh, uh, prevalent uh, uh, at the end of the management with uh, caplacizumab, and uh, also cases of uh, thrombocytosis, uh, uh, and especially some uh, cases of, uh, let's say, a severe thrombocytosis. Uh, so these patients were uh, 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 systematically reported, uh, although the relationship between the use of caplacizumab and uh, thrombocytosis is uh, speculative. So this was for the management of TTP at the acute phase. So you can appreciate that the introduction of caplacizumab with the uh, therapeutic armamentarium uh, uh, for this disease uh, is completely changing the landscape of the uh, prognosis of this disease. And it is uh, uh, obvious that the use of caplacizumab uh, 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 seems to circumvent the uh, bad prognosis uh, of, uh, of the disease. So now the uh, disease at the acute phase is becoming uh, uh, of good or even very uh, good prognosis. So now let's move to the prevention of relapses. TTP remains a severe condition uh, and uh, uh, even for relapses, uh, we have to consider uh, this disease as a severe condition. So this is to say that we do need to prevent efficiently relapses in this disease. Patients with TTP uh, can frequently relapse. This occurs in uh, more or less 40% of cases, simply because patients after the acute phase can drop adamsotin activity. Uh, moreover, uh, keep in mind that for each relapse, patients will have to uh, 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 be treated again with daily plasma exchange, steroids, immunosuppressors, and so on. So this uh, will expose patients to further complications due to the treatment. Uh, there is an, increase, uh, an increasing report of uh, neuropsychiatric uh, sequela in patients who experience uh, episodes of TTP. And it is likely that the more patients relapse, the more they will experience uh, neuropsychiatric uh, events during follow-up. So uh, there is a need to uh, uh, efficiently and aggressively prevent relapses in this, in this disease. So there is an uh, efficient way to uh, prevent relapses in uh, TTP because as you know, the very first event before a clinical relapse is a drop in adamsotin activity. So this is the very first event and uh, thereafter, uh, if patients are left 
with a severe adaptating deficiency, then they will develop thrombocytopenia and then microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, organ involvement, and then death. So the strategy here was to uh, treat these patients preemptively at the very first step of the disease when they only have a severe acquired adaptating deficiency. So in these patients, uh, uh, we and others propose a preemptive treatment with rituximab. So in those patients, otherwise in clinical remission, but with only a severe adaptating deficiency, the systematic use of rituximab allowed to remarkably prevent clinical relapses. You can appreciate this in this uh, picture. You can see that uh, historical patients in the bottom curve were exposed to uh, clinical relapses. Uh, this uh, curve represents 23 historical patients left with a severe adaptive deficiency and no further action. And you can see that within a median follow-up of seven years, uh, uh, up to 74% of patients relapsed. 11 of them experienced multiple relapses and two of them died from the disease. So this is an unacceptable uh, uh, situation. And uh, uh, this was a, a strong argument to uh, strongly suggest the preemptive uh, uh, to uh, uh, propose uh, actions in these patients. And you can see uh, uh, that uh, the use of a preemptive rituximab in this patient could shift this curve to the top and prevent relapses in a substantial number of patients. So this is uh, uh, so far um, a uh, historical uh, curve because now with the, the uh, increasing experience we have in the use of preemptive rituximab, uh, we can prevent uh, clinical relapses in more than 90% of patients, simply because for those rare patients who do not respond to preemptive rituximab, we propose more intensive regimens with rituximab derived from what we uh, propose to patients with uh, chronic lymphoid malignancies. In those patients who do not respond to intensive rituximab, we propose alternative treatments with cyclosporine. So all this to say that we can now efficiently treat those patients to uh, 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 improve and normalize Adam certain activity, which allows the prevention of clinical relapses in almost all patients. So lastly, uh, I will in the end uh, uh, talk about uh, probably the most important aspect nowadays to uh, uh, efficiently prevent deaths in this uh, disease. And to uh, illustrate uh, this aspect, I will present you the story of a 45-year-old uh, uh, patient who started her story uh, in uh, uh, February 15th in the evening uh, when she uh, started to have a, a digestive uh, picture consisting in nausea, epiglossic pain, and she uh, uh, put that uh, uh, clinical picture uh, on the back of a meal of muscles the day before. Uh, the day after, she started uh, vomiting with uh, hematemesis. Her husband found she was uh, a bit uh, yellow, so she uh, consulted her GP. And uh, uh, on February 17th in the morning, uh, the GP uh, requested an uh, abdominal ultrasound sonography that was normal, but blood cell count uh, identified uh, uh, B-cytopenia with uh, a severe thrombocytopenia, uh, 6,000. So in the evening, the patient was uh, hospitalized 
uh, uh, in the uh, local hospital. And uh, as she had a severe thrombocytopenia and no clinical features besides uh, jaundice and uh, uh, abdominal pain, she was considered as having an autoimmune thrombocytopenia. So uh, she was uh, um, treated with uh, steroids and uh, she was told that uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia was a begin disorder and that she was uh, going to uh, recover soon. So I was later in the night, the biologists phoned to the uh, clinicians in the uh, emergency department to uh, say that uh, they could uh, observe schistocytes on blood spleen for these patients. So the biologist uh, 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 said that uh, to the clinicians that they may reconsider, revisit the diagnosis of ITP into uh, the diagnosis of TTP. But the answer of the clinicians why, as the patient does not have clinical involvement and only a severe thrombocytopenia, the diagnosis of autoimmune thrombocytopenia is the good one. So we go on with only steroids. <coughs> Unfortunately, some hours later, the patient presented a sudden uh, a cardiorespiratory arrest. Um, she died from this condition, uh, given the, the, unexpected, the completely unexpected death. Uh, uh, there was an autopsy. And uh, through the autopsy, the diagnosis of TTP was made. And uh, uh, retrospectively, we could find an aliquot of serum for this patient that had been sampled when she was admitted. And on this uh, serum sample, we could uh, uh, assess adamsetine activity. And of course, the enzyme activity was undetectable with high levels of antibodies against the enzyme. So you can see here that the diagnosis of the disease was made, unfortunately, after the patient died from her condition. So as you can uh, appreciate, learning by experience can be painful, but it's still more painful not to learn from experience. And this uh, uh, story uh, illustrates that to make clinicians aware of TTP diagnosis remains one of the most important issues in the, uh, in the field. And now we have so efficient regimens to treat those patients at the acute phase. Uh, as you have seen, regimens that include capacizumab along with the historical treatment and so, and so on. We uh, see almost no death anymore, okay? You could say that only some rare patients, especially some elderly patients, uh, could still uh, be exposed to death at the acute phase, but virtually all patients treated correctly with uh, a, a triplet regimen should recover from the disease. But this is true uh, uh, if the patient is in the circle of the management. Uh, uh, and as far as the patient has no diagnosis, nobody can do anything for, for the patient and the patient is exposed uh, to death. So it is crucial to uh, make aware clinicians uh, about this diagnosis to fasten the diagnosis of TTP and prevent uh, clinical uh, uh, di uh, uh, diagnostic delay. So uh, for this, uh, please uh, keep in mind what uh, uh, is probably the most important aspect of my talk. In a patient with thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia, or only with hemolysis, uh, look after schistocytes and think about a uh, 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 repeated search of schistocytes. And if the patient has schistocytes, you must consider the diagnosis of TTP uh, until uh, the demonstration of an alternative diagnosis. Second scenario, in a patient with thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia or only hemolysis and organ failure, 
even if you do not have a schistocytes, think about TTP first, okay? And it is only on adapcetin activity that you will uh, be able to consider an alternative diagnosis if the enzyme activity is normal. Third pillar of the uh, uh, diagnosis, once you have uh, diagnosed or strongly suspected the diagnosis of TTP, congratulations, you did the most difficult aspect of the management. So just refer the patient to or contact a trained team for uh, the treatment immediately, if required, okay? So at the time of uh, reference centers of Google uh, and so on, it is very easy to find a specialist of the disease 24-7 uh, 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 every part uh, in the world. So this is to uh, summarize uh, the management of TTP. Uh, as you could appreciate, we are uh, moving uh, uh, to uh, uh, complete management of this patient based on the pathophysiology and uh, now the, the, the management of the disease at the acute phase is based on the three uh, pathophysiological pillars of the disease. The first pillar is adamcetin supplementation uh, that is achieved uh, so far with daily plasmic change and probably soon with the recombinant adamcetin, which is under investigation through uh, therapeutic uh, trials. Second pillar, immunosuppression through uh, the use of corticosteroids and rituximab. And the third pillar, the use of uh, inhibitors of uh, platelets VWF interaction and uh, specifically caplacizumab. So uh, as you can see uh, in the field of TTP, we uh, greatly moved uh, 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 toward more precision medicine to improve uh, TTP prognosis. Uh, it's interesting to uh, have in mind that death rate of uh, acute TTP scarcely changed for more than 20 years. And interestingly, most deaths uh, occurred in the very first days of the management. And historically, these patients needed new strategies uh, uh, that uh, 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 had to be uh, efficient immediately. So uh, uh, targeted therapies based on anti-VWF agents, and this is the case for uh, Kepacizumab and soon the recombinant adamcetin are helping and should further help in decreasing TTP early mortality. Clearly, Kepacizumab frontline in association with immunosuppression and Perspective exchange nicely prevents unfavorable outcomes in TTP. And clearly, uh, Keplacizumab is a new player in the uh, landscape of uh, TTP treatment. These new therapies, uh, interestingly, were derived from a better understanding of TTP pathophysiology, reflecting a shift from empiricism to targeted therapies in this disease. And the very exciting uh, 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 perspective in the management of these patients in the next future is to uh, uh, consider uh, alleviated therapeutic regimens, uh, especially uh, plasma change free regimens uh, that we are uh, starting to, to, to consider uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. So uh, in the next uh, future uh, trials uh, should be proposed to uh, uh, evaluate uh, the feasibility in these patients of uh, regimens uh, associating uh, immunosuppression, caplacizumab, and possibly uh, only plasma exchange or even only uh, the recombinant uh, adamcetin. And this would be, uh, this is of course a very exciting aspect uh, in the field. And uh, it's likely that the story of uh, TTP treatment will have to be uh, rewriting in the uh, forthcoming years. 
And this is uh, uh, lastly uh, to uh, thank uh, all uh, the colleagues with uh, whom I worked on this uh, topic uh, in France in the left part of the slide, as well as uh, throughout uh, the world uh, in the right uh, part of the, of the slide. Uh, there is now an international uh, group uh, devoted to the, the, the study of uh, TTP. We recently published in blood uh, uh, new uh, recommendations for the, um, uh, regarding new definitions uh, of uh, uh, TTP uh, and regarding the response to treatment that include uh, the monitoring of uh, Adam Sutin. So uh, yes, this is to, to thank all these, uh, these uh, people and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Coppo. I will echo the feedback in the chat that say thank you for this excellent lecture. So I really will stress thank you very much for this excellent lecture. So I have received first um, question um, privately. So the first one is about COVID pandemic. I will copy paste in the chat and I will let you read. And I, I've received five questions privately, so I will let you appear them in the chat. So this is the first one. Yes, so uh, is the COVID pandemia limiting the use of rituximab frontline that you adopt in France? No, uh, not really. Uh, the first point is that we did not observe uh, 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 an explosion of uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 in uh, TTP patients. And uh, our experience, uh, 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 through our experience, we did not observe uh, uh, cases of TTP worsened by COVID-19. So basically, we continued to treat those patients uh, as usual, uh, including uh, uh, regarding the use of uh, immunosuppressors. And uh, well, we uh, have no patient in mind who experienced uh, an infection with COVID-19 while he received a, a rituximab. Uh, we anticipated uh, with the international uh, study group uh, declined uh, management in case of an unavailability of a plasma exchange in emergency. So we had anticipated uh, regimens for these patients who may have included only plasma infusion and or even no plasma use, but immunosuppression and capacizumab. We did not uh, need to use such uh, regimens, but uh, well, this is to say that we uh, were ready to treat these patients with uh, an elevated treatment if uh, plasma change were not uh, uh, available. So second question, how important is the evaluation of anti adamcetin antibody Tighter together with Adam Cetin activity in the frame of deciding when to stop caplacizumab. In our experience, we do not monitor uh, the antibodies against Adam Cetin in the management of these patients. Uh, in adult patients, I would even say that outside of pregnancy, the use of antibodies is almost useless because virtually all adult patients outside pregnancy with the TTP have an acquired form of the disease. Congenital form of TTP in uh, adult onset are almost only observed in pregnant women. Okay, so you can definitely consider that in adults, a first episode of TTP is in virtually all cases an uh, autoimmune form of the disease. So you can start uh, confidently with uh, 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 rituximab in these patients. And in my experience, I never wait for the antibodies to start 
rituximab. I usually uh, wait for adamcitin activity because we use the uh, French score to start plasma exchange and keplacizumab in steroids. We usually uh, wait for uh, uh, adamcitin activity only, not the antibodies, to start rituximab. And even during follow-up, we only uh, uh, assess adamcitin activity uh, regarding the use of preemptive uh, rituximab. So next question, uh, do you recommend a different therapeutic approach in patients with a systematically no detectable titer of autoantibody? Yes, yeah, this is a, a nevertheless a good uh, question because uh, again, in adulthood, uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, TTP have no detectable antibodies in 20% of cases. And this is uh, uh, typically patients with an associated condition, an associated condition, patients with a history of HIV infection, patients with a, a history of a, a general infection, uh, autoimmune disease, and so on. So those patients uh, indeed uh, have uh, more frequently no detectable antibodies. This does not mean that the enzyme deficiency is due to another mechanism. Uh, my, uh, 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 I believe that those patients do have antibodies, but simply these antibodies are too low to be detected. And this is to say that those patients have to be treated in the same way than patients who have detectable antibodies. In our experience, we are uh, uh, um, studying specifically those patients, and we will soon report uh, this uh, experience. Uh, we treat these patients uh, in a similar way than those who have antibodies. And I can tell you that those patients res respond to rituximab in the same way that those we, who have uh, antibodies. So we are going to have a lot of problems to maintain CAPLA while adamcitin activity gets normal. Do you think that a level of 10% should be enough? Yes, very interesting uh, question. And I agree that uh, in the next future, we should adapt the duration of Kaplacizumab treatment on the basis of adamcitin activity. Formally, uh, uh, as not all the centers in the world uh, uh, had an easy access to adam certain activity, it was decided that uh, patients had to receive capacizumab for at least 30 days after the last PEX session, and then uh, 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 still more if adam certain was depressed. But the experience showed that for a substantial number of patients, adamcitin activity improves before day 30 after the last PEX session. And in those patients, of course, capacizumab could be stopped. So I agree that as soon as adamcitin activity improves, capacizumab can be stopped. And the threshold of adamcitin activity to consider that patients are protected from TTP is empirically of 20%. 20% because in our experience and in the experience of others, we never saw features of uh, TTP, TTP relapse in patients with more than 20% of adamcitin activity. We have a very rare cases of patients with acute TTP and adamcitin activities around 10 to less than 15%, along with detectable antibodies. This means that in a very rare subset of patients, one could observe features of TTP uh, uh, while adamcitin activity is between 10 and 15%. So to be very uh, uh, comfortable, mm -hmm. I would say empirically, this is not evidence-based medicine. I would say that empirically, the threshold of 20% is very safe, okay? 10% is very uh, uh, tied to the red line. 
and I would again empirically uh, 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 consider 20% as a more safe uh, threshold. Uh, next question, should we treat TTP patients with cabalacizumab when they only have anemia and thrombocytopenia? Yes, this is another crucial question. Uh, one uh, general question was to address whether all patients with TTP should be treated or not with cabalacizumab. The point is that uh, at the, the diagnosis of TTP, you can nicely uh, 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 anticipate the risk of death and refractoriness on the basis of uh, the troponin level. It was shown that patients at the diagnosis of TTP who have an increased troponin level are more exposed to refractoriness and death. Okay, but you cannot anticipate the risk of exacerbation. And uh, 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 for now, there is no uh, uh, biomarker able to predict uh, uh, if a patient is going to experience refractoriness. And refractoriness is a frequent event. Up to 40% of patients may present with uh, uh, exacerbations. So this is why we, uh, 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 it's the, the, our policy in France and in many other countries to propose systematically caprasizumab to all patients, even if they only have uh, hematological features, because you cannot uh, 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 be sure that these patients will not present an exacerbation throughout uh, the, the early management. Uh, next question, you mentioned one patient was refractory to treatment in your capacitivism group. How did you handle refractory disease? Do you have experience with increasing plasmic chain frequency? Yes. Yes, I have to come back to this uh, uh, specific patient because uh, indeed this patient had uh, um, the definition of refractoriness, which is historically a lack of doubling of platelet count after four full days of correct management. But this specific patient, uh, in the end, while he did not double platelet count after four full days of treatment, nevertheless, he slightly improved platelet count even after uh, day four of treatment. And we didn't need to intensify treatment. We only observed the patient uh, 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 under the, the, the same treatment. And in the end, he uh, normalized uh, his condition, uh, platelet count and the, the clinical uh, uh, picture. So in other words, this patient was a, a slow responder uh, um, uh, uh, instead of a uh, refractory patient. So uh, we had to consider him as a refractory patient, uh, given the historical definition, but, but basically we didn't need to intensify the, the treatment. And this is to say that under, uh, uh, in the Kaplasizumab era, uh, one can anticipate that refractoriness will, be, will become a very, very rare condition. And uh, on this very, very rare patients, uh, one could uh, anticipate that uh, the best treatment would be twice daily plasma exchange along with cabalacizumab and immunosuppression. But again, refractoriness in the area of cabalacizumab should disappear. Uh, next question, uh, if we cannot titer antibodies, Adam Sutin, what would you recommend us about this? Again, uh, the most important aspect is to have Adam Sutin activity in a, a fair uh, delay uh, of time. Because uh, as you know, we emphasize in the ISTH recommendations that the use of Keplacizumab um, is uh, uh, pending on the availability of adamsetin activity. 
and we do not recommend the use of capacizumab uh, if there is no way to have uh, adamcetin activity uh, to prevent uh, an overuse or a misuse of the, of the agent. So what is important is to have uh, uh, adamcetin activity in the days following the clinical diagnosis of TTP. So again, uh, in uh, adulthood, outside the context of pregnancy, I'm convinced that you do not need antibodies to show that the patient has an acquired form of TTP. You only need antibodies, uh, uh, the, the, the search of antibodies against lamcetin in childhood, of course, because you have half of patients uh, who have a congenital form of the disease and the other half have an acquired form. So it is, of course, more challenging to uh, make the diagnosis of congenital versus acquired TTP in childhood. So you do need antibodies in children. And this is the same for pregnant women with TTP. Half of them may have a congenital TTP, especially if they experience a first episode of TTP. But outside these two situations, in adulthood, again, uh, you may not uh, require the antibodies to manage your patients. Just consider they have an acquired form. Uh, what is the maximum expected duration of rituximab in the prevention of long-term relapses? The maximum expected duration? Yes. Uh, I would say basically it, it, it is quite uh, variable from one patient to the other. Uh, and I would say that you have three scenarios. The first scenario, which occurs in 10 to 15% of patients, is that rituximab is not efficient. Okay? You have some cases of patients who do not respond to rituximab. So in these patients, you have to intensify the treatment, as we do in patients with uh, chronic B-cell uh, malignancies, so which is the patients one to two years with a, 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 a rituximab every two months. And um, in the end, these patients uh, 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 respond to treatment. Some patients, 20% uh, of cases, respond durably, and some of them definitely to uh, rituximab. So with a one-shot administration of rituximab, adam activity normalizes for years. But the most frequent scenario in around two-thirds of cases is that those patients need repeated infusions of rituximab every 12 to 24 months. And this is nicely correlated to the peripheral B-cell recovery. So this means that with a uh, uh, rituximab infusion, you completely uh, uh, remove B-cells from uh, blood, those patients respond nicely uh, to rituximab, but uh, uh, 12 to uh, 24 months later, while the B cell uh, uh, count has uh, normalized, antibodies may uh, reoccur and adamcetin activity may drop again. So, in those patients, you need to start again uh, rituximab. So the most uh, common scenario, uh, uh, which occurs in two thirds of cases, is that you need to uh, perform rituximab every one to two years. Thank you very uh, much, Professor okay. Copper.